Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My name is Eunsil Kang. I'm one of the associate pastors here at Riceville United Methodist Church. It is my great joy to welcome you to our worship service at The Vine, an online campus of Riceville United Methodist Church. We are truly grateful to have this opportunity to worship together. No matter where you are joining us from, we cherish your presence with us today. So our prayer is, through today's worship service, you will have a meaningful encounter with God. So now let us prepare our heart before God. Take a deep breath and feel closer to our Lord. Please join me in our opening congregational prayer. The words will be shown on your screen. Let us pray. Holy and loving God, thank you that through the death of Jesus, you have put to death our old selves. Now, through Jesus' resurrection, you are resurrecting us to a new life. Help us to live as those who have been brought from death to life. In Jesus' name, Amen. closer walk with thee 
granted Jesus is my plea. Daily walking close to thee. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm Pastor Julia Hayes. I'm one of the associate pastors here, and it's my great privilege to get to lead us now as we go before God in prayer. Will you join me now as we pray together? Holy and loving God, we thank you for gathering us together today in your name. God, we thank you that your spirit is big enough, expansive enough, that even when we aren't together in person, you are still able to unite us together in your presence. God, we thank you for the resurrection of Jesus. And Lord, we confess that sometimes, even after all these years, it is hard for us to believe that such good news can be true. And yet, God, you continue to triumph over death with life. Lord, we give you great thanks this week for the work that our General Conference of the United Methodist Church has been doing over the past two weeks. Lord, help us now as we go from this gathering to remain committed to our ultimate goal of making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. And Lord, it is that same world that we pray for today. We know that there are so many broken places in this world, and we ask that your presence would come and heal the brokenness that is all around us. We pray especially today for all of the places that are affected by war, particularly Ukraine, Gaza, and Israel. Lord, we pray also for the brokenness even in our own community, especially for those who find themselves sleeping outside, who don't know where their next meal is going to come from, or who are searching for work. Lord, we ask that you would be present in their lives. Lord, we pray for all of those who are suffering in mind, body, or spirit. And we pray especially for all those who we name before you now, either out loud or in our hearts. God, we thank you that you not only hear our prayers, but you listen to them. And we know that you are trustworthy. And so trusting in your unfailing love, we pray now together the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us, not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we transition now into a time of reflection and generosity, I'd like to remind you that you can always give to help support the ministry of Wrightsville United Methodist Church through the mail and through our website, wrightsvilleumc.org. Let us now continue to worship God. Wrightsville kids, I'm Pastor Julia. I have a question for you. Have you ever gone on a camping trip? Do you like to go camping? Or maybe you haven't been on a long camping trip, but have you ever sat around at a campfire? I love campfires. I love sitting outside with my friends and my family, and I love roasting marshmallows so we can make s'mores. And I also love telling ghost stories. Have you ever sat around a campfire 
and someone started telling a story and saying, once upon a time, something very spooky and scary happened. Well, I think ghost stories are fun, but sometimes they're scary too. Did you know that there's actually a time in the Bible where people in the Bible thought they were living through a ghost story? It was the disciples who are Jesus' friends. And a couple of days ago, they had seen their friend Jesus die. Then they were all sitting together inside somebody's house and all the doors were locked. And all of a sudden, Jesus walked in and he said, peace be with you. Well, they had seen their friend die. And so the only thing they could think was that he must be a ghost. So do you know what Jesus did? He said, no, no, it's really me. Look, look at my hands and touch them and look at my feet. You can see I'm really here, it's really me. But they were still kind of nervous and thought maybe he was a ghost. So do you know what Jesus did? He said, well, why don't you give me something to eat? I'm hungry. And he ate a big piece of fish. And he said, well, a ghost can't do that. Can you imagine what it would have been like to be there? Finally, the disciples realized that it really was Jesus and not just a ghost. Sometimes things are so good and so happy, it's almost hard to believe that they're true. And that's what the disciples went through. But even though sometimes it feels too good to be true, it is true that Jesus is alive and that Jesus' love is so big that nothing can stop it. I'm really grateful for that. Let's say a prayer together. Dear God, thank you for making me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for Jesus. I love you too. In Jesus' name, amen. Bye. Good morning. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm Doug Lane, Senior Pastor here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church, and I'm honored to be able to bring today's word to you. It's been five weeks since Easter, but we're still in the Easter season. And so we're going to be discussing um, scenes where Jesus appears after the resurrection, where he appears to his disciples and to others um, along the way. And um, today is uh, another one of those fascinating stories. And so I hope you'll read along with me. We're in the very end of Luke chapter 24, beginning in verse 36. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened? Why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You're witnesses of these things. And see, I'm sending upon you what my father promised. So stay here in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Holy and loving God, Lord, we uh, wait for power from on high. We know that you've poured out spiritual gifts to each and every one of us. Lord, I pray that you will help us to understand the scriptures. And Lord, where I have misspoken or where I misspeak today, I pray that you will forgive me and that everyone here will be able to hear your words and not simply mine. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
You know, you ever do that thing where you're talking to somebody younger than you and you'll say, you know, hey, I remember when we got our first microwave oven. Or I remember when we got our first television set. Or our first computer or cell phone, depending on how old you are or how easily you adopt new technologies. Um, I remember uh, when we had our first cell phone, you know, you only carried it around in your car and it was about the size of a brick. You know, you remember those days? Um, my kids can't believe that you used to be able to walk onto a plane without taking off your shoes, your belt, your hat, your jacket, emptying your pockets, handing over your cell phone along with your dignity while displaying all your personal items on a scanner for all the world to see. I'm actually for safety, so it doesn't bother me in the least. But again, a generation ago, we didn't do that. I also remember the stern talking to I received from my grandmother once for potentially not using modern technology. When Tara was pregnant with Olivia, my grandmother asked me what sex the baby would be. I said, we haven't found out yet. We're thinking about waiting to see whenever she's born. My grandmother said, oh, no, you won't. We didn't have that ability back in my day, and I would have loved to have known. You have to find out. Okay, Grandma, calm down. We found out. The sonogram was correct. It was a girl. But let's talk about the cell phone for a minute. You may have heard that today's cell phones are more powerful than the computer that NASA used to guide Apollo 11 when Neil Armstrong first walked on the moon. That's true. Actually, today's cell phones are more than 5,000 times faster than the computer that NASA used back in 1969. I don't go anywhere without my smartphone. But you know, the iPhone didn't come out until 2007. I can't imagine life without it, and yet it's only been around for 17 years. What did we ever do before? Honestly, as a child of the 70s and 80s, it never occurred to me that one day we'd have smartphones. I thought everyone would have flying cars by now, but not a computer in our hands. There are events in, a lot in this life that amaze us. They might fill us with joy. They might make us wonder whether it really is possible. It's hard to believe, even standing on this side of history, that some of the things that I've talked about today were actually accomplished. My parents watched Neil Armstrong walk on the moon. My grandmother was amazed by sonograms. I'm flabbergasted by the smartphone. These kinds of things blow your mind. 2,000 years ago, it was an impossible situation when 11 men gathered to discuss in private their next move. They were frightened and confused. Life seemed to be closing in on them, and it was not possible for them to continue in their three-year-old ministry. Here were the facts. They were betrayed by one of their own. The crowds had turned against them. Their leader had been executed. They denied their relationship to him. And any further development of their leader's ideas would almost certainly mean their own execution. Into this hopeless scene walks a man they never expected to see. Their leader, the one who was supposed to be dead. They were so startled by this event that to a person, they feared they were seeing a ghost. The resurrection amazed them. It filled them with joy and turned their lives around. It's an impossible story that positively happened. And the evidence of the resurrection is all around us today. Let me ask you, what amazes you most about the resurrection of Jesus? What impossible aspects of it fill you with joy? What parts of it sound too good to be true? Let me share a couple of things that I think are amazing to me. First, the reality of the resurrection amazes me. We're told by the scriptures that when Jesus walked into the room where the disciples had gathered and said, peace be with you, that it startled them. They were frightened. It had to be a ghost. What else could it be? Now, these were not the kind of people who were easily convinced. These were men of common sense, so they doubted. What else could they do? And this is one of the central reasons why I believe the resurrection is a reality. It's a plain story. It is simple. It is to the point. It is not contrived to try and prove what happened. 
Look at some of the very realistic parts of the story that took place. First, they're startled and frightened. Wouldn't you be? Of course you would. So Jesus tries to calm the disciples down. He then invites them to touch him. You can put your hand through a ghost, but not through flesh and blood. They examine the scars in his feet and his hands. You know what? They still didn't believe. They're filled with too much amazement and joy, the scriptures say. Seems too good to be true. So he tries a different tactic. You got anything here to eat, he asks. This raises a pertinent question. Would a ghost invite himself to dinner? They give him a piece of broiled fish, and he eats it in their presence. And they can see that he's eating, and the fish isn't like, you know, showing through his body. So they're starting to come around. Finally, he sits down with them and begins to teach them why everything happened as it did. It was to fulfill the Old Testament prophecies. The resurrection is a reality precisely because it's described so simply. Recently, a group of fifth and sixth graders were asked to define scientifically some things in our world. When asked to define the law of gravity, one child wrote, no fair jumping up without coming down. That's true, pretty good. Another said about thunderstorms, you can listen to thunder and tell how close you came to getting hit. If you don't hear it, you got hit, so never mind. <laughs> I guess so. A few were asked questions about clouds. One of them said, I'm not sure how clouds are formed, but clouds know how to do it, and that's really all that matters. Can't argue with that. One more. A youngster said, when planets run around and around in circles, we say they're orbiting. When people do this, we say they're crazy. True once again. There are many things that amaze us in this world. And I don't know about you, but I like to be surprised to see something happen that I didn't think was possible. And when something impossible happens, like the children, have to resort to simple explanations. No fair going up without coming down. Amazing things need simple explanations. I suppose that's one of the joys of being a Christian. The resurrection is amazing, but it has a simple explanation. You see, this man Jesus... His life, his teachings, his death, his resurrection, and his promises continue to surprise me. I read his story again and again, and I say to myself, come on, this isn't possible. How am I supposed to explain this to people? And that's when Jesus sits down with his disciples, and he gives a simple explanation. It's over in verse 46. He tells them, Christ suffered, Christ died, we must repent and receive forgiveness. Oh, and one other thing. Tell all the nations of the world what you've seen. Pretty simple. When you go up, you got to come down. It's that simple. The resurrection is a reality, an impossible thing that positively happened. The simplicity of it all convinces me. Secondly, the reason for the resurrection amazes me. Now, what is the reason for the resurrection? The reason it happened was the forgiveness of sins. That's what Jesus says to his disciples there in verse 47. It says, it happened so you and I and everyone else we know might have a new start with our lives. It happened so we have the chance to start over for the person who's had trouble in relationships, for the person who's had trouble at work, for the person who doesn't really like themselves. For the person with lots of regrets, for the person with anxiety about the future. Look, he came back and forgave Peter for denying him. He came back and forgave Thomas for doubting him. He came back and took away the grief of Mary Magdalene. He came back and took away the confusion of the men walking to Emmaus. He came back to give direction to his disciples. He came back to give us peace. That's Easter. The risen Lord comes back to life and assures the disciples that they are forgiven. He came back to share with them. And he comes today, this morning, to share with you the joy, the encouragement, and the forgiveness of Easter. That's the reason for the resurrection. It sounds impossible, but it positively happened 
for a reason. Third, the reach of the resurrection amazes me. This message of forgiveness is to be carried everywhere we go. Repentance and forgiveness of sins, said Jesus, will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Notice he said, beginning at Jerusalem. It's not to be confined within the walls of my city, my home, my church. We can't expect the world to come to Jerusalem to hear the message. Jerusalem's going to have to go to the world. Jesus didn't command the whole world to go to church. He commanded the church to go to the whole world. Jesus explained to his disciples the reason for the resurrection. He immediately told them to reach the world around them with this message. If they haven't done that, well, it probably would have just become another Jewish sect. Just another movement within the walls of Jerusalem. We are not in our love and devotion to make the gospel simply something we keep within our own hearts. Like the story of Luigi Terizio, who some years ago was found dead one morning with hardly any creature comforts in his home, except for the presence of 246 exquisite violins. He'd been collecting them his entire life. They were all stored in his attic. The best violins were found in the bottom drawer of an old rickety chest. The greatest of his collection was a Stradivarius from 1716, which had never been played. And this man's devotion to the violin, he robbed the world of that exquisite music. How many of Christ's people are like old Teresio? In our very love of the church, we fail to give the glad tidings to the world. In our zeal for truth, we forget to display it. When shall we all learn that the good news needs not only to be cherished, but also to be shown? Don't bury God's good news of Easter at the bottom of a rickety old drawer. Let the people hear the great sound of his music, that Christ is risen. It's amazing, isn't it, that the story of the resurrection is now in your hands? It's yours to use, to reach out with, to pass on to your children and to your neighbors. Don't keep it. Don't confine it to the walls of your home or to the walls of Wrightsville Church. The resurrection of Jesus is a message to the nations. An amazing, joyful, impossible story that actually positively happened. It's a simple story. That's what makes it so real. It's a story of forgiveness. That's why we need to talk about it. And it's a story for all nations. That's how far we need to share it. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Holy and loving God, we know the resurrection wasn't just you showing off. It's not a magic trick. It's something that happened so that we might be forgiven and have eternal life. Lord, thank you for this gift. And thank you that the disciples had the courage to share it. Lord, may we be like those disciples of old and tell the story, the good news of the resurrection of Christ, because it's for everybody. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Our service will continue with Holy Communion. And so we invite you to get a piece of bread and some liquid so that you might consume the elements uh, with us. And so if you don't have those, why don't you hit pause on the video. Go ahead and get those things together and come back and join us. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another, praying together. Merciful, Merciful God, God, we, we confess, confess that, that we have, have not loved you with our whole heart. heart. We, we have failed to be an obedient church. church. We, we have, have not done, done your will. will. We, we have, have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have, have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Need. Forgive, Forgive us, we pray. Free us from joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I invite you to continue to pray in silence.
Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the, In the name, name of, of Jesus Christ, Christ you, you are, are forgiven. forgiven. Glory, Glory to God. God. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And, and also with, with you. you. Lift up your hearts. We, we lift, lift them up to the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It, it is, is right, right to, to give, give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice, in union with Christ's offering for us, as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died. Christ, Christ is risen. Christ, Christ will come, come again. again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. This is the body of Christ, broken for us. This is the blood of Christ, shed for us. You're invited now to consume the elements that you have in your home. Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you've given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Jesus' resurrection is real. It actually happened. It's, it seems impossible except God did it. And he did it so that we might be forgiven. Boy, that is something we all need to hear. And it's something that he wants everybody else to hear too. So let's share it. Go forth in peace. Peace Jesus brings to us. Have peace knowing that you are forgiven. And knowing the message is in your hands. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.